Hello. I'm Rick. Hi, I'm Andre. How are you, Andre? Very fine. Where are you? I'm in Iceland. Ah. Really? Yeah, where are you in the world? <laughs> are you in Iceland because you live in Iceland? Yes, I live and I'm from Iceland. Are you in Reykjavik? Yes, in Reykjavik, yeah. I'm downtown Reykjavik now. What's the what's the weather like in Reykjavik today? Uh it's uh it's a good maybe ten degrees Celsius, cloudy, a mild mild spring day, like we call it. Uh, some some rain this morning. So so where are you? Oh, I'm in um, I'm in New England. I'm actually in the smallest state in the U.S. called Rhode Island. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I used to live in uh, New Hampshire. What were you doing there? I was uh, studying at Ma math and reading. I, I lived there as a child. I. Uh, uh, my my father was a is a is a doctor, so uh, he was taking his special specialties in uh, in New Hampshire. So we lived in uh, in uh, Dartmouth. Huh? Oh, in Dartmouth. Oh, oh we, 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 lived, we lived in we lived in Hanover, Hanover, New Hampshire. Hanover, right. New Hampshire. I I went to high school in Concord, which is only like forty five minutes from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I know New Hampshire well. It's a it's a complicated place <laughs> it's very ideal i actually uh, i i lived there when i was seven and i came back maybe 30 years later when i was 37 and everything was exactly the same it was uncanny how how everything was <laughs> just exactly like it was when i left it was like it was like nothing had happened then the houses were not older they were the same age in a strange way, they were as old as they were when I left, but not older. They were just as old. It was, it was quite bizarre. And what did you go back for? Uh, my sister lives there. Ah, she's still there. Yeah. So she went back. She she's a brain surgeon. So uh, so she's living in in Hanover, New Hampshire. So I go there every year. Wow. And are you a writer? Yeah, I write uh, poetry. Short stories, uh, fiction, non-fiction, kind of everything, all, all, all types of literature. And, and uh, you write in Icelandic. Yeah, I write in Icelandic, but my work is published uh, abroad in, uh, yeah, in many languages, maybe 30 languages or so. Wow. I'm, so, I'm, uh, I assume that the reason that we're here is that I'm totally obsessed with Iceland. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah, I'm one of those. What do they call them? Iceland friends or whatever that word is? Iceland, Icelandophiles. Yeah. <laughs> Icelandophiles. Yeah, so, I really what, love Iceland. So what's your, uh, what, what do you do? Oh, I'm a writer also. You're a writer, okay. So uh, what, what kind of writing? Well, I've published a bunch of novels. I published short stories. I published what, what, two... Two memoirs. What's your name? Rick Moody. Okay. Okay. And what's your last name? It's Magnusson. Andre Snyder Magnusson. Ah. Well, so, well, we have to swap books at the end. We have to swap books, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you write uh, in all genres, so. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I've been writing more nonfiction lately, especially you know, I teach, that's my day job. I teach writing at Brown University. Okay. Um, as, but especially, even though it's the summer and I should be writing fiction right now, I'm so um, sort of pole axed, as they say, by the quarantine and everything, that fiction seems like a steep hill somehow. Yeah. So I'm having trouble with it. Yeah. So have you been writing most of your life for? I guess I started, well, I really wrote as an undergraduate a lot. I wrote in high school some, okay. and then I really wrote in undergraduate days, and then I've just been doing it ever since. Okay. Yeah, and you? 
Yeah, I've never had a proper job, actually. I, I've been writing. I, I already published my first books when I was in the university. Wow. And, and uh, so I had like three books when I was 23. And uh, so I never went into the real world, really. I, uh, I just kind of merged into, I just continued. So, uh, and I, we have a good grant system here. So that kind of made it possible for the first years. And then, uh, yeah, so I've, I've been writing for 25 years this year, actually. This is my 25th anniversary of my first book. Ah. 20, it came wow. out in 1995, my first book. Huh. Wait, you wrote poems first? Yeah, I had two books of poetry the first two years. Went to short stories, went to, I, I have this strange habit of betraying my audience. That is, uh, uh, I did a book. Have you been to Iceland? I have. Yeah, yeah. I did, one, I did one book called Bonus Poetry. Uh, it takes place in a bonus supermarket uh, in Iceland. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mythological travel through a bonus, po bonus supermarket based on the Divine Comedy by Dante. So you start in wow. Paradiso, the fruit division, you go to Inferno, the meat products, and then you end in the purgatory, the cleaning products. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that book actually was a bestseller. It was one of my first books. So I had a very big start. Oh. And, um, but then I went to, uh, my next book was a children's book after that. And, uh, and that book actually did Quite well, and but I did. So my publisher wanted another children's book, but then I made sci-fi that kids can't understand, which is uh, a novel called Love Star. It's published in in America. Huh. Love Star. And then when people wanted more sci-fi, I did non-fiction, a book called Dreamland, uh, a self-help manual for a frightened nation, which was about non-fiction about the destruction of the highlands of Iceland. Ah, uh, for Alcoa, they were building dams and all kinds of all kinds of nonsense. So uh, yeah, I've never got into the interior because you know it's so hard to get into the interior unless you have a four wheel drive vehicle or something. So I mostly yeah. have been around the perimeter, but yeah. I long to go into the middle some. So when when were you here last time? Um, when was I there last? I bet it was like 2013 or thereabouts. But I've been before that at some length, like several weeks, um, uh, four or five years before that. And then I got into this thing where anytime I was going to Europe, I would lay over and spend days in Reykjavik and just go wander around a little bit, you know. So do you I have any... Yeah. Do you have any, any friends here? Do we have any? Uh, no. You, so you've just been as a tourist. You don't have like a... Nowhere so to stay. You, know, you don't have a local you have coffee with? No. Uh-uh. No. Well, now you, now you have. For that. I'll get there. Now I do. When I yes. come to <laughs> But my thing is that I'm, I, in addition to finding the topography extraordinary, I'm like deeply engaged with the Icelandic sagas, which unfortunately I can't read in the original, but but I really, really love the Icelandic sagas. It's a whole thing. I just taught them this semester, in fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so that's like a narrative point of origin for me as a writer thinker. I really love the sagas. Okay. What's your favorite saga? Well, I just taught Inglaug Serpent Tongue, that one, which I really like. Um, I can't oh, yeah. pronounce any of the words. Oh, yeah. um, uh, and then the Eric the Red one is really great. And I really like the, you know, the, the North American ones, you know, the yeah. ones that are about North American exploration. Yeah. The yeah. ones are very fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, I just have a whole thing about the Icelandic sagas. 
which are, you know, as you probably know, not well read in the United States, but for whatever reason. Yeah. It's funny when they're translated because uh, sometimes you will w wonder, uh, because the language, we, we see it as some kind of a golden age language. And, but the problem is it's, it's not like, it's actually not, the vocabulary is very, very basic. So it's like Gunnar was a man. Yeah. He, was big, he was big and strong. He lived <laughs> in the West Coast. His wife was Brynhildur. She was big and strong. <laughs> so, so she was the daughter of this man. That was the daughter of that man. That was the, the you know, so it's like, uh, sometimes we feel like it's, uh, the language becomes a bit barbaric when it's translated because it's like, it's, it's very, they're not using too many, uh, they're not describing the landscape. He, he, he ran over the vivid red fields to, you know. The, yeah, yeah. They, they, never, they never mentioned the Northern Lights. In all the Icelandic sagas, they never mentioned Northern Lights. Wow, that's a really interesting detail, which yeah. now that you've said it to me, I will never forget. Um, and so what are you writing and, now? Oh, um, short stories. Okay. Yeah. And you? What are you writing? Uh, I I just finished the book uh, for last Christmas. A, a, a book that came out. Uh, it came out in October last year. It's called On Time and Water, and it's basically kind of trying to grasp climate change through personal narratives, family stories, uh, through language. Uh, the idea is that the issue is so big, it's like a black hole. Mm. That uh, words like ocean acidification, they don't make any sense. They, it is the biggest word in the world, ocean acidification. That is, it's the fact that the oceans will change more in the next 100 years than they did in the past 50 million years. So, uh, so, so, uh, so how can you compare one generation, one, one single human life with a time scale that is 10 times the total evolution of man? So that means uh, the words are too small. Mm. Uh, I can't say it's enormous in the 12th degree or something. And, and the way we scale up language is through mythology or, or, or stories. I, I can't just say the facts because the, the, the language is not scaled up in the facts. Mm. It's also scaled up through our emotions, through our previous connections in our brains. So, so I'm using kind of a strange way. The metaphor I use is, is the black hole. That is a, you can't look straight at the black hole because it draws in all light, so you don't see anything. So to understand the black hole, you have to look around it at the periphery. And the way to understand this issue that is so large that language collapses, uh, you can't look straight at it. You have to look around it. So, mm. uh, so I'm uh, to see how it's pulling at the neighboring galaxies. So I'm using family stories, mythology, science and trying to make like a narrative arts out of that so um so that that was my last work but the book the work that i'm doing now is uh i i, I just finished a documentary film oh wow and it was supposed to open it's a it's a bipolar musical documentary with elephants and uh it was supposed to open the day the theaters actually shut down because of COVID. So me and my co-director, we, uh, we were wondering, we were of course very disappointed. We had done all the marketing and all the stuff. So we were very disappointed, but, we, but then we thought, okay, if we're making documentary and we're in the middle of the most historical moment <laughs> of our lives, <laughs> Should we just stay home and, and be sorry about something that happened in the other world, in the other life? So we got a very, so we called the, the, the rental of, of the gear rental for equipment rental. 
and we ask them, is somebody documenting this? Is somebody out there? You know, are your cameras all in house or are they out there doing something? And they said, all our cameras are in house. So that's why we knew that nobody was documenting and at least not with the best cameras in Iceland. So we got a very good camera and we went out and we made a modern Decameron, you know, Decameron mm. uh, by Boccaccio. We, so we have 10 people telling us stories for 10 days. So in the height of the Corona in Iceland, we, we went and visited artists and asked them what's in the air and asked them to tell us a story. So we had 10 stories and, and, and also if, if this was a symbol of some greater change in the world. Uh, this virus thing. So, uh, so that was nonfiction in the sense that they were real artists and they improvised the stories? So these were just stories from their lives or just telling them, you know, the stories of what they were doing and, uh, and how they were feeling and, and what, what this big, big pause in the world meant for them. So, uh, so we, 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 by mistake or not by mistake, we, we have material for at least a half hour documentary out of this, which was fun actually. What was it like in Reykjavik? Was it, was there was there a lot of of sort of viral calamity, or did they just shut down and it was quiet? How did it go? No, so Iceland actually handled it quite well. So they they were very they were very uh, on it. That is, they were they were uh, very quickly capturing those that were had the disease and tracing those that they had met, putting those people all, all in very strict quarantine. And they were very adaptable in turning around the systems, closing the elderly homes, protecting, you know, so, so nobody could visit the old or the weak for two months. And so they did not have these mass contaminations that killed so many people in elderly homes all around. So we yeah. did not have those incidents. So, and then they had, they did not take the people that got the corona into the hospital, but they had a very, a very, uh, that is not until they became very ill. So, mm. uh, but, but not, but at the right moment actually. So, uh, so they would call people regularly that had the disease and call them in when they were because it, it, it's a very sneaky disease. You, you maybe, suddenly you can't breathe and then an hour later you're just dead because it, it, it can catch you very fast. So they, they had, a, they never ran over capacity in their unit. So, so these are actually national heroes now. Are, are, it was not fronted by politicians. Mm -hmm. So we did not have a politician telling us what to do, but we had a, chief epidemiologist and, uh, and uh, a guy uh, like a policeman or from the National Guard. And, uh, and these people are all like, we have their names on t-shirts, you know, do what they say and stuff. So, so uh, and, but we did also have like, more like a Sweden in, in, in the way that, well, all our swimming pools closed and all our gyms and all sports activity, but preschools, and children's schools, elementary schools were open. So my kids, uh, two of my kids, they went to school and uh, for two hours a day, which was a huge relief for families. Yeah. And, and there was uh, no curfew and most stores were still open. That is, you could always go and buy stuff. So, so it, they, we, I think Icelanders are quite happy with how this was managed. And we lost 10 people, about 2000 people got the disease. So they, the death rate is like 0.5% or something. Right, so you guys have really passed the infectious. Yeah, they, they really passed the test. So there's no disease now in Iceland currently. Oh wow. Nobody, nobody in the hospital. And I think six people that they know have an active disease, down from 2000. So it's a, 
it's quite good. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's pretty bad here, as I'm sure you've heard. But yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I've got, I have a lot of family in New York City and Connecticut, and they were both, you know, areas that were yeah. pretty, pretty. Uh, Did you know people that got uh, ill or? Oh yeah, yeah, my sister-in-law and um, yeah, I know what a friend from childhood died of it, you know, really? and, uh, so that's not unusual. I think I'm unusual in that I don't know that many people, you oh, know, wow. yeah. but, um, but in New York City, you know, everybody knows two or three people, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, you know, the weird thing is all the ancillary stuff like um you know people staying sick for 60 days and having all these nerve problems and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. yeah 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 because yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that going around now you know people yeah. i know had it or you know all have all recovering from residual symptoms of one kind or another oh, wow. okay. yeah. yeah it's a crazy situation uh who do you blame for this is that is that how it went out of hand is that government or yeah i think it's government i mean not to belabor a political discussion but i absolutely feel like you know there's a, there was a an article in the new york times last week that said if we had instituted uh social distancing one week earlier than we did just one week yeah. we would have saved thirty six thousand lives yeah. That's that's what I could see from Iceland is that, and I actually wrote I wrote an article for Emergence magazine. That's that's my latest writing. I think it's coming out today or tomorrow. And so I was kind of this was giving a great insight also into kind of a politician's imagination. So it's you know you could you could just say you know the situation in Italy now will be London after two weeks. Yeah, but, but still. So I called my son, and he was studying in London. And I said, "You have to come home now. You know, you don't want to be locked in a dorm or or anywhere." He was in in a in in a university in in London. So I said, "You don't want to be locked in a dorm or or stuck in in a in a lockdown." He said, "Oh, you you're also stressed in Iceland. You're like uh, you're all overreacting up in Iceland." I said, "No." What's happening in Italy is what happened in, in in China two weeks earlier. It's Italy now. It's 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 probably all over already, all over London already, and it's gonna kick in after two weeks. I, I promise you. And and of course that was how it was. And but still they were they were having full public transport. They were having concerts. Everything was going on. And so that's uh, that's I think. That's what saved us here in Iceland is that we did have this social distancing uh, on time and this one week earlier that that really counted. Yeah, I mean, I think in the US the, the you know, the highly fragmentary political situation was a perfect uh, sort of proving ground for the virus. It just was going to be that it was going to flourish. Yeah. No red state believes anything that they're told by a blue state and and vice versa. And so, you know, just as in England where Boris Johnson kind of dilly dallied about it, um, you know, the way it was handled in the presidential administration just made it really easy for a lot of people to ignore the whole thing, you know. And that that's why we have a hundred thousand dead people. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge shame. So in, in Icelandic translating Iceland to we, we had ten deaths and that would be like ten thousand in the US. So yeah. that's kind of the difference of politics. Yeah. The ninety thousand difference yeah. of, uh, that we didn't need to have. Yeah. That we didn't need to have, yeah. Yeah. Um and so I've been, because I teach, I'm really trying to keep my eye on how the, 
quarantine thing is going to play out in art. So I'm curious if you have any sense of whether it's going to have ramifications, thematic ramifications for what you do or what you make as you go forward. For, for myself? For, uh, for Yeah, for yourself, or if you see it happening around you at all. Yeah. Wondering about art. I think it's, uh, well, of course, the, the problem is you're just living through times where art forms are impossible. That is, theater is impossible, or, or art is banned mm -hmm. by health reasons. Music is banned, theater is banned. Uh, I had a one man show on the big stage here in Reykjavik. Uh, I couldn't do that anymore. Theater, uh, yeah, theater, movies, concerts, that's having a huge impact on the scene, of course, of so people that are living on that. But I'm, and I don't feel like, because the only escape seems to be going more digital. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I actually interviewed lots of artists about this. I actually asked, so I was about, <laughs> I asked uh, like 10 artists, no, 16 artists, we took 16 interviews. Uh, and I asked them this question, you know, is this inspiring you? Is this, uh, is this giving, is this putting you into another direction? And some of them said that things that, like that, this only seep in like after 10 years, you know, it will, it has to go into the subconscious, into the body memory until it kind of has an output again. Uh, some of them had made some art as a direct response to it. One, one said that for myself, it had the impact on my art is that I made a whole work of art about this. That is, I will have a, uh, the apocalypse, it's called now the working title, uh, apocalypse, the, the great, the great pause. And, uh, and uh, this modern decameron. So uh, for my own art, I did an immediate response to it, but uh, and I think I think what it changes is that it changes our imagination. That is, so basically politically, I think it will change us, and that of course goes into art. Is that we know now that there's a stop button. That is, if something <laughs> is harmful, uh, there is actually a button you can press and stop things. And uh, and we've seen it happen. So uh, so for people that are worried about global warming and inaction, where we're not talking about ten thousand deaths versus ninety thousand deaths, we're talking about you know ten million versus a hundred million, or you know we're talking about huge numbers of people that uh, are at stake in exactly the same type of action versus inaction scenarios yeah. so i think so i think the generations that went through this in school your, your students uh, those that are 10 year old now that know they will be raised knowing that there is a stop button that the government can stop and then restart things and there will be a stronger cry of stopping the harmful things and putting real resources into fixing things. I think, or I'm hoping it will. That's, so I think more in terms of activism and politics, it will kind of change how we look at, so it's not only the market. So when the market falls, it falls into the hands of the state. So in the end, the state is kind of, we saw that the state exists and and, 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 that a, and that a weak state is not good either. But also, of course, we have the problems of strong states as well, you know. I'm not saying I want authoritarian systems or totalitarian systems, but, but uh, we have seen that for the common good of people, there has to be a state. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about it in similar ways in terms of the politics 
and you know and the sort of weird paradox of this country is that the 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 current administration that so loves authoritarian um imagery and and veneer actually turns out to be really weak you know yeah. our presidency is weak yeah. and so when it came to sort of nuts and bolts, government intervention, and so on, the only thing they know how to do is is write a big check and then start trying to assign blame to other parties, you know? And I feel like that was and is yeah. And I'm really hoping that that, that notion that government can be effective and have a role will um, be much on everybody's minds in November when we have a, another election. It also shows us that individual health doesn't really exist. Uh, your health and your fitness is worthless if the community is not taken care of, you know, so, so this virus kind of binds us all together into, into a unit. So you you know you can't leave anybody out. So, uh, but how about your writing? Does it in, do, does it inspire you, or does it just make you dreadful, or what what kind of a what what direction does something like this push you into? Well, you know how you were talking about it is how I I thought about nine eleven. You know because I was publishing quite a bit as I'm as I guess you probably were already two uh when 9 11 happened but i was in new york you know the day well actually i was in dc that day but i lived in new york at that time and you know the effect of 9 11 on writers in new york yeah. was really curious and fascinating like it was a silence um that ensued and you know there were weeks and months where People really debated, for example, whether satire could ever happen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether, yeah, whether comic writing was valid. <laughs> and, and this kind of um, earnestness seized the day for a little while. Yeah. Um, and I feel like those kinds of questions are, are going to orbit around writing as a production, probably, in the U.S. for, for a little bit. Um, and I've written a lot of comic writing. I mean, I'm a person whose last few novels had a pretty pronounced comic flavor. And I definitely feel like a sudden calling of a certain kind of earnest realism right now. Yeah. I, I sort of feel like it wants my attention. Yeah. And uh, so I'll probably go that way. What what's who's your publisher in the states? Um, right now, it's it's um, a little imprint called Henry Holt, which is part of Macmillan. Okay. Who publishes you? Uh, I am with uh, I have two books with Seven Stories Press, ah. down in New York, and I have a book with Restless Books. Uh, that's a small publisher in New York. And uh, Open Letter in Ross Sister is doing Time and Water. Ah. And who does you in England? Uh, I have a Pushkin Press in one book. And then uh, my next book is by Serpent's Tale. Oh, yeah. I had my last British book was with Serpent's Tale, too. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Is, is that yeah, I like them. They're great, I think. Yeah, yeah. Who are you dealing with? Uh, I can't remember any of the names. And yeah, can't remember. But yeah, but they did a good job and they made a better jacket than the American jacket. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, uh, so have you been writing for many years or? Yeah, since my, yeah, my 20s, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these guys are texting us to try to get us to we're, talk we're, about. We're, 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 we're on, uh, we did not talk about music. Are you a musician? A little bit I am. Are you? Uh, no, I, I have almost no musical talent. But do you have music appreciation? 
Yes, very much, yeah, yeah. And, well, uh, can I ask you about Icelandic music then? Yeah, of course, yeah. So who are you listening to that you like of Icelandic musicians? Uh, the le most, the latest young musician would be Auður, uh, A-U-D-U-R, Auður. He's a kind of very young, highly talented, kind of funky, funky musician. Uh, I've been, uh, I've been working a lot recently with uh, Högni, H-O-G-N-I, Högni. And I've also collaborated a lot with uh, a band called Moom. I love, I love yeah. that band. Yeah, that's were, a great band. They, they are really, really lovely. Uh, they were, uh, I'm kind of their, uh, their fairy godfather. Uh, they were created in uh, my, uh, I say that because the next word is fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were created in a play that I made. I, I wrote a play in 98 for a college and uh, so the band like a very talented kind of theater group in a college and uh, and the band that was created for this play was was moon and uh, so I, I i was there when they were created and that was quite fun and uh, so I, i've been working a lot with moon I've been working with Hogni, H-O-G-N-I, Hogni, Hogni. He, he was also in Gus He was, uh, oh, yeah. his, his, his voice is like seal. He's, he's, <laughs> like, a white, he's like a white seal. Uh, and, uh, and then I've collaborated also with the uh, bedroom community, Valker Sigurdsson. Huh, so, so you know your contemporary Icelandic bands then. Yeah, I've, wor I've worked a lot with uh, with uh, the Icelandic music scene, uh, so I, I know I know them quite well, and they've been working in many of my projects. And so I'm uh, I have I have Hakni with me on stage in my one man show. It's actually actually a two man show. So I have music and myself. How about you? Um, let's see. I mean, I really listen to a lot of experimental music is my thing like things that have lyrics are sort of too busy for me so i can't for example i'm not a i'm not a well-equipped fan of hip-hop you know i don't listen to it very much um but i love i love jazz and electronic music and contemporary serious music and sort of you know any 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 new flavor of classical music type stuff yes. um but i had like a big punk rock childhood so mm -hmm. i loved rock and roll as a young person i it just doesn't exist in the same way now so i don't i'm not as yoked into the top 40 or or whatever is popular very well yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I do, but I have and do now love a number of Icelandic bands. Okay. Um, yeah. And now I'm forgetting, you know, the name of the really obvious, most famous band in Iceland, uh, you know, uh, where the guy made up his own language. What is that band? Oh. Sigurros. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love Sigurros for a while. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they were one of my favorites too. Actually, uh, I, I don't play music myself, but I, I, I really thrive on music. And, uh, so, but I actually liked techno when that came about. I was, uh, I was a big Pixies fan. Uh, so they kind of saved my life in the early 90s, no, early, late 80s, late 80s, late 80s. What? Yeah, it's a uh, great band. Yeah, because uh, I, thought, I, I thought for a moment that I didn't like music anymore. Because <laughs> the, the top lists were so boring. It was all uh, music made by Stock Aitken and Waterman. It was like Rick Astley and 
and uh, Bros Brothers and all that. And, and I actually thought I had, a, I had an existential crisis when I was 14. And I thought that I didn't like music. I just, I just turned on the radio and I didn't like anything. And I just, I thought I, maybe I'm just like my father or something. I, I just don't like music. Or my, my father maybe likes music, but he didn't, he didn't like what was on the radio. And <laughs> I was like, maybe I just don't like music. But then I got to know Pixies. But then techno came in when I was maybe 17, like 808 State and, uh, and some of the stuff coming from Bristol or something where they were experimenting with blowing up the sound systems of, of the nightclubs. And I felt like I was privileged to be the first person to actually enjoy certain sounds. I was kind of aware that these were sounds that nobody had enjoyed before. And these were beats per minute that nobody had been able to enjoy before. So I was kind of aware of, aware of that. Yeah, so. so Somehow I wrote, I wrote a long essay and it was about techno in Europe and it was a attack on techno in Europe. It was an attack like, on techno. An attack, yeah. yeah. It, it's, like probably very well, long it's probably a well-deserved attack on, on Eurotrust techno. You know, that's, that's, uh, that, that makes total sense. But, but the first wave of 808 state and, uh, and, and that stuff, that was all cutting edge experimental stuff. Yeah. Uh, making sounds, you know, like, like tracing it down to, uh, to craft work. And, and then uh, if, you, if you listen to like uh, Einar Ör, he's he was in the Sugar Cubes with Björk. Yeah. And I had, they were my favorite for a while. They called Ghost Digital. And so they were like making like anti-music from techno that is very creative using these sounds but in a very creative anti-music way so as soon as you were supposed to get pleased they demolished the, the, the song yeah i mean that's the stuff i like of electronic music now is the stuff that's against dancing in a way you know like i really like that band awtecker a lot and i like aphex twin yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Like, I like him when he's you know demolishing the yeah. expectation of four on the floor dance rhythms and stuff how, how about the word fantasy do you write fantasy well i read a ton of science fiction as a kid i was very animated by it as a teenager and i did at one point write a sort of a science fiction novel um so so i do like that stuff which is a sort of unpopular opinion in the United States in writing is, is it unpopular? Yeah, in writing circles it is. Yeah. Oh it is, okay. Yeah. In okay. fact I had a pretty famous American writer, I think I can say his name, Paul Oster came up to me at one point after I published the science fiction novel and he said, You're a great writer. You're one of America's greatest voices and you're ruining your career with this. What, don't what write this. What, don't that, write this. <laughs> what's that? What novel is that? It's called The Four Fingers of Death. And it has a Mars, a long, long Mars passage in it, like 300 pages of a Mars mission. Okay. Yeah. He, he really, I guess, didn't like that one very much. But. So I like reading that stuff. Uh, and, I, and I seek it out to some degree. Yeah. I, I, that this, I, I was uh, deeply inspired by fantasy, by, uh, you know, writers like Kurt Vonnegut really just oh, yeah, made, I love made, made, made me want to write. And then uh, Calvino, Primo Levi, uh, Borges, Bulgakov, uh, Eastern European, like, uh, uh, Kapek, Salamander War, and all that stuff. I was, I was just, I, I never went into deep fantasy. I never went into the hardcore sci-fi, but I, uh, but I used to drench myself in folklore also, like Icelandic sagas and folklore and, and the more quirky stuff in Icelandic literature that we have uh, very dark folklore, like volumes, they're, they're like this thick volumes of, 
and their index almost like a their index here like a, like they did when they were indexing everything in the in the 19th century or uh, like so it was like men fall in love with elves elves so it was indexed like revenge of elves uh, trolls fall in love with humans trolls kill humans uh, uh, witchcraft famous women witches famous men witches famous men witches revenge so it was a uh, and it was a uh, so when I was reading that, I felt like I was really reading kind of real literature, that is, uh, real stories, something that really happened. And that's why I felt often when I tried to read fantasy, like Tolkien and stuff, I felt like that was all made up. While I could index the other and I could find a real event where a troll actually seduced a young man and, and stretched him out into becoming a troll himself. So, so that, that was more imperfect literature, but but it felt like these were real historical documents so, of some kind of fantastic mind. I want to read some of these Icelandic legends. Do you think they're in English? I think very few of them are actually in English. Just a handful of these folklore is is in English, but but very much of it is basically stuck in Icelandic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could I could see if I can if something exists. Some some of these stories exist in English, but often it's more like the iconic sweet ones. Uh, it's it's it, the strange stuff is often just a very short, quirky story that that doesn't even make as a real story. It's just a story says that this boy was lost in the Highlands and he was found two years later, and he had grown to be three meters tall. <laughs> so, 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 so it's not like something you translate. It's just like a, like a side note in history or something. I mean, that's what's so interesting about Icelandic literature. And to me, what you're saying is that you guys have a genuine tradition of incorporating fantasy elements into the literature and that that's, you know, more quote unquote genuine than these kind of stylized mass marketed fantasy works, which that's part of what's exciting about the work that comes out of your country, I think. Yeah, like when you read the sagas, it's very normal that they jump into fantasy. They, 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 uh, they dream something. They have all sorts of events and supernatural things that take place, blood rain or, or, or at one moment, all the swords on the ship start battling each other uh, without anybody holding them. And, and everybody's just half dead after all the swords on the ship started fighting. So, so all sorts of stuff like that makes you uh, yeah, always attached and go back to like the sagas. Yeah, I mean, I think the sagas are are a sort of opening salvo in realism in a way. They're really realistic. And they're about sort of, I don't know, I shouldn't be telling you this. You're Icelandic. I'm just some guy who likes them. But that's how I feel about it, that you know, realism as an idea begins with those works. But they are nonetheless works that, are, that have fantastic elements in them. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, when I was younger, I wanted to you know, you wanted to go against the establishment and, you know, you know, the teacher loved one saga and I was like, oh, he can't be, you know, he can't be credible. You know, I want to, I, I want to be a, a rebel. But then I read the book and I was like, damn, it's good. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, like, like came this chapter, you know, like, like they had this huge build up. It's in the old saga, it's in the old saga. Yeah, uh, and it's one of these stories that I told. Like, uh, so it's like a build up into something, and suddenly comes uh, on the ship. The swords start fighting, uh, blood rain, and then a giant comes out of a cliff and he calls some names. And it was like comes like, so you have the the arts, and then it comes like bang, 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 and then it con continues. And I had like I was twenty or something. I had like. I had like goosebumps. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is, this is somebody that probably had a captive audience 
you know, in, in some cold <laughs> whole winter. And he just he just knew exactly how to how to like you know get people just just how to blow their mind, you know, just and 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 maybe had a few winters to master it or something. So yeah, I was nobody knows the author, but uh, somebody that was a great storyteller. Yeah. Um, I actually do want to ask you about this last prompt because I'm always really interested in in how fatherhood influences one's artistic practice. So how many kids do you have and how old are they? I have at least four children. Um, and uh, they, are, uh, they are 12. They, they always change. One just turned 23 yesterday. So, <laughs> so they're, they're 12, 14, 18, and 23. So uh, wow. it's, a big, it's a big Brady Bunch. And uh, what, what are, how are they gender expressing themselves? So uh, my oldest is a boy and the other three are uh, girls and they, they haven't shown any complications about, <laughs> about that yet, but uh, <laughs> they're of course free to do that. But uh, yeah, so three girls, the oldest is a boy and uh, so I think that may be, I was very young, I was 23 when my boy was born. So I've had the same wife and, and the whole family. And we have managed to, I think it might have maybe brought me a bit into children's literature. Because I was very thrilled with fantasy and, and I started reading children's books and I was kind of bored of them. And I started thinking of also, it, it made me, when I had the child, my first son, I made me maybe more responsible in early days and thinking in a more serious way about the world without maybe losing my humor. But, but I, 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 I had sincere worries about, I just started to think very much about things. And uh, so I think that changed me in a way of, of having an extension of myself. Do you have kids? I do. I started really late. Um, so, I mean, I'm 58, so I'm pretty old. But I have an 11-year-old daughter, and I have a 3-year-old a son. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Young. That's young. So, I miss yeah. the so I was just I was just saying today, I, I miss that age, that uh, kind of that, uh, fun, <laughs> that fun, that fun crazy age of, of three-year-olds so. yeah he's they, a real they can, they can be a handful <laughs> yeah yeah especially in quarantine like it's a 25 hour a day job in quarantine with a three-year-old you know yeah. and he doesn't he doesn't get it or understand or no you know but uh but i think that later on i will have been really happy that I got to spend so much time with them, you know, yeah, I get, yeah, that probably. I got to, yeah. So, so did it make you more responsible having kids? Well, I was like you, I was very irresponsible in my twenties. I actually got a gargantuan uh, drug and alcohol problem together in my twenties, but then I, I stopped all of that. Um, and then I would say that the kids have definitely had a profound effect in the, in the area of responsibility and also thinking about sort of bigger questions a little bit. Yeah, it's good. I feel lucky about it as I'm sure you do too. I, I, I didn't feel like, a, I didn't, you know, I, I travel a lot and, uh, Kids in Iceland, it's, it's strange actually with kids in Iceland is that, uh, so I had my kid, 23 year old, and, uh, and we felt quite old when we had him. So lots of my friends were already having kids and, and, and then we had suddenly four kids uh, in maybe 10 years or something. Yeah, from, from, from 97 to 2008 they came. But we discussed deeply 
and uh, seriously, if we were ready to have a dog. <laughs> 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 so we were like having these discussions like are we ready to have a dog but what about the commitment <laughs> and who's going to raise the dog and who's going to teach the dog to sit and do this and that and, and what about our careers you know like what if we, what if we want to go abroad and what, do, what, what about the dog and so, so we spoke about having a dog for like five years until we finally had a dog because we, there was so much peer pressure from the kids that wanted a dog but the kids just you know they just <laughs> they just kind of just came so uh, I, I think that's the difference between iceland and maybe scandinavia or, or germany where they have the dog discussion about the kids and should we have kids it's easier to uh, easier to just uh, have kids and and then you find a place for them instead of planning them beforehand there's always space for a kid yeah yeah or, of course not for everyone in, i'm not going to be unpolitically correct but but <laughs> <laughs> in in our case it's there was space for kids yeah. um what are their names of your kids what are their names yeah uh, the boy is called Theo, like Van Gogh's brother, and uh, the girl is called Hazel. Hazel, nice. And what are your what are the names of your children? Uh, my first, my oldest son, his name is Hlynur. It's uh, H L Y N U R, and and when we had that sweet little child, we did not expect that he would go abroad someday, that nobody in the world <laughs> could pronounce his name. <laughs> so, so, uh, so he's, uh, yeah, he's having so he had some trouble this with, when he moved to England and nobody could pronounce his name. So he was just called H. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and then my daughter is Christine and uh, Christine Lovisa, the second daughter is Elin Freya, like the goddess, and the uh, third is Hulda Filipia. Hulda Filipia. So, so those are the kids. Everything sounds beautiful in Icelandic, so all those names sound beautiful to me. Oh, thank you. Likewise, your names. <laughs> hey, hey, is, uh, is that uh, what does that mean? Is that the tree? No, it's a yeah, the tree. But but really, what it is is a is an old name in in sort of American English. Hazel is a name from like the nineteen. Like, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. a German grandmother from Hazel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a famous uh, 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 um singer of traditional music in the u.s called hazel dickens and dylan wrote a song about her called hazel um so in a way it was like i was picking names because i wanted them to sound really antique yeah. so great. will you give me recommendations of contemporary icelandic writers that i should read yes uh i would check out Sjón, do you know him? Uh -huh. S J O N. Uh huh. I'll type his name. I would check out Sjón. Yeah. I would check out Christine Omarsdóttir. I would check on uh, who else is translated. Uh, I think Einar Maur has some books, and uh, I think uh, Ófeigur Sigurdsson has a book, He's, he has a, has a book by o, Open Letter as well, it was like a very, I thought it was untranslatable. But but it 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 was translated. It's a, it's kind of a crazy book. Uh, I would check about check out. Yeah, and also uh, 
Kristin Eiriks is also, she's, she's also, uh, she's also recently published and I think she got some translation prize. I think at least these, these authors, uh, either Ava, yeah, and of course Hallgrímur Helgason. I would check out his novel, uh, Woman at 1000 Degrees. Hallgrímur is, 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 a, is a genius, he's a, he's a visual artist. And lots of our, lots of our uh, writing actually is quite conceptual in Iceland. Uh, visual artists becoming writers or like writers and visual artists uh, which could apply to Sjón, Kristin Ómarsdóttir, Hallgrímur Helgason. They come often from poetry and visual art into the novel and, and that gives a completely different type of approach to language than the traditional, you could say, writer's workshop novel. That is, you know, like, like the novel coming out of the novel. This yeah, is yeah. novel coming out of poetry and concept, which which can be uh, which is literature that I, I I tend to like a lot. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm very kind of language sensitive, concept sensitive. So it's not like the normal novel. There's always like a twist to to most things. That that would be applied to Sean Christine Omerstadtir. And Hallgrimur, they all have a, a strong poetic visual artist. I, I, think that, I think that is what I would say uh, kind of makes Icelandic. I, I would say that with this fantasy bank, you know, with, with the, the sagas and everything, I think this has kind of given the, the if you could uh, identify Icelandic contemporary literature, it would be that it's, or you could say many crime novels. If you take the crime out of the crime novel, and you have a novel. <laughs> <laughs> many novels are kind of like that, you know, so, but, but these are novels that are, that have uh, some kind of an extra layer in, in, uh, in, in, in the art. Huh, that's good. I'm excited. What do you want to know? American writing? Yeah, what do you recommend? Is there poetry I have not discovered? Is there a, a novel that I have to read? Let's see. Or something recently you, you read that I, I, I might like? Being an old Kurt Vonnegut fan. <laughs> you know, I really was a Vonnegut fan too. I really was. In fact, that book I told you about, The Four Fingers of Death, is... is um, dedicated to Vonnegut. Okay, okay. Did you meet yeah. him? I met him twice. Okay. Yeah. He was a scary dude. The second time I met him, I was so, um, and I, I never feel this way, but I was so intimidated that I just stood there like an idiot. I could okay. not think of anything to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I knew his wife, I, his ex, his widow. I know her and I knew her pretty well. And she actually said, you've got to come over to the house and I'll introduce you to Kurt. And I went over there and he sort of came down from his writing studio and he looked at me. And he sort of gave me this withering once over and then turned and went back up to the writing studio. <laughs> what was I going to say, you know? I read every book you wrote. <laughs> I'm your number one fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm your number one fan. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a shame when you meet your icon, and it disappoints you. It's, uh, yeah, never meet your heroes. I think is a very nice piece of advice. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to come up with a good American novel that I can recommend. I mean, the problem is the American novel is sort of a problem right now, and it's in a some kind of chrysalis state where it's on the way to becoming something new but it's certainly not conceptually pitched and noted for its you know 
for the influence of poetry. That's not a thing that is happening, really. Because the American realism is so entrenched that yeah. that most novels in, in in America are, you know, halved off from that that Iowa writers workshop model, you know. Yeah. So I've been reading, you know, ancient things. I'm reading the uh I'm reading a new translation of the Aeneid right now. You know, and that's the kind of thing I want to read is ancient things, which is why I read the Icelandic sagas. But you're not, you're not writing anything that takes place in ancient times. You're just using it as fuel for contemporary writing. Yeah, it's more about the form than it is about the imagery, you know. Yeah. Or I could imagine updating the imagery, but I don't want to get into the rut of historical recreation. Mm -hmm because that in America results in this kind of, um, you know, slightly dead historical fiction model that I don't think is very good either. Yeah, it's, um, I, 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 I had a short attention span, so I, I never read uh, Dostoevsky and that stuff like these kind of big, bigger, bigger novels. I, I was always more into, uh, yeah, like, like Borges or like something that was loaded with ideas. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, and uh, most of these writers are, have lots of kind of strangeness in them and ideas without, without being pretentiously strange. It's just, there's some natural strangeness in, in their approach to everything. So. I mean, that's why I'm liking Europe, literature from Europe better than American literature right now. Because it has that, you know, more, I don't even know how to put my finger on it, but because it's not belaboring questions about what realism is or how odd realism could be, you know. So... But here, I'll tell you one really great American band in case you haven't heard them. Okay. Death Grips. Yeah. Also, I really like this guitar player, Chris Forsyth. Okay. And, uh, and if you haven't heard, here's one top 40 recommendation. If you haven't heard uh, this record, you should definitely hear it. It's really amazing. Yeah, I'm going to take a picture of it. Yeah, it's a uh, music. Uh, sometimes I fall out of music when I'm writing a lot, and but sometimes I use music to uh, to uh, I use music to start writing. So. Uh, I can put so the the late my latest book in in English is called The Casket of Time and it's a children's book. Maybe your twelve year old might like it. Yeah, let's yeah. swap. Do you want to swap? Let's swap. Definitely. All right. All right. I'm gonna type in my address, um, and then you type in your address. And next time you come here, uh, if you need a, if you need a, um, you know, somebody to interview you in New York, you should give me a shout, and I'll be your interlocutor in New York. Super, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, my book was supposed to come out in September, but they postponed it until March next year. Yeah, so when so, you come, if you get I'm to do sure, it. I'm not sure if it's a good idea. Is, is, uh, is everything in such a bad state? Or uh, No, that's a good idea. That's the right idea. It's the right idea to postpone it. Yeah, because it's so fucked up. Books are so fucked up right now that, uh, that um, you know, every book that's coming out right now, I would say between now and September, is, you know, got a question mark beside it. Okay. 
Yeah, so I think it's smarter to put until spring for sure. I wasn't sure if things would get better or what. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> maybe there's still cows next year. Even, so. I mean, I think books did well initially because people bought a lot of books to read in quarantine. But I think next year will be better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a. It's a. I, and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I yeah, I was just wondering if the next wave would be there, or you know, like who? who I I just suddenly was like, how can you plan for next year <laughs> as well? It's like, yeah. It was I'm going to put my email address in here too, so feel free. And do you have a, you have coffee in Reykjavik waiting for you. All right, it's a deal. So when I come next, uh, yeah, I'll come harangue you in person. I, I was, I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to be in America, yeah, this fall, so. I might still be going there, so I'll, I'll give you a shout if if there's anything. If I'm if I'm on the on the on the continent. Yeah, to New York? Are you going? Is that the idea? Um, maybe there, there it was, it was, everything was cancelled. I was like supposed to be everywhere this year. So oh. It was supposed to be my big year, yeah. and uh, yeah, this was the year that I was really going to become really famous. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I was supposed to uh, travel all over, but I, I'm uh, my book. My new book is coming out in twenty libraries, so uh, so I was, but I was actually a bit pre devastated about all the travel that was involved. So I was supposed to be like on a tour from now until November. Yeah, but but that was all cancelled which was sad in a way, but on the other hand, it gives me space to write and create new things instead of just being in airports, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Really nice meeting you. Yeah, what a pleasure. Yeah, it was really fun and, and I couldn't be more, uh, I, I could not have had more enjoyment, I don't think, because I'm happy to talk to an Icelandic person any day. So <laughs> it's a real pleasure. I'll, I'll, uh, do you ever read books on, uh, on uh, because my new book is not published, but it's fully translated. Do you ever read on uh, an iPad or something? Oh, or yeah. do you prefer real paper books? No, I do both. Okay, I can send you my new book on, for, an, for your iPad. Perfect. Okay. It's uh, the time and water book. So good. So I'm looking forward to the swap. I, I uh, get to know your stuff. Okay. Okay. All right. Super. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.